Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Roger, for this amazing opportunity for all of us. Marsha Gessen's CV alone could figure among the books assigned in Roger Berkowitz's Courage to Be initiative, a series of courses taught by Bard faculty each year that examine courage and cowardice in equal measure. It's not just that she has written nine books that all take on the insidious push and pull of totalitarianism. For example, The Future is History, How Totalitarianism Reclaimed Russia, which was shortlisted for the National Book Award in 2017, or The Man Without a Face, The Unlikely Rise of Vladimir Putin. But all her works are reminders of how easily our rights can be taken away from us. We are prone to lazy optimism and sloppy nostalgia for happier times that never really were. Autocracy doesn't just show up one morning with a sign announcing that democracy is over. Gessen knows this all too well. After all, she was dismissed as editor of the Russian popular science magazine, Vakrug Svetar, for refusing to send a reporter to observe Putin hand gliding with the Siberian cranes. Good for you. No threats have ever stopped Masha Gessen for defending LGBT rights, for chiding us about our armchair liberalism and the loss of our moral compass. When the New York Times trumpeted that Trump had swerved left, she writes, the country got out the popcorn and settled on the couch to watch a season of jolly deal-making. When, I quote, the recently departed White House Secretary appears at the Emmys, we all join the, the senator in having a chuckle at the spectacle of presidential mendacity. Read her about the Tsarnaev brothers, about pussy riots, about AIDS. And let me share one incredible piece with you just to prepare you for the worst or with Masha Gessen's help for the worst that still could be avoided. Before I read this beautiful piece, I'd like to remind you that she is not only a great staff writer for The New Yorker, a regular contributor to The New York Review of Books, The New York Times, she has received too many accolades to talk about here, among which a Guggenheim and Neiman Fellowship. Um, she worked for 20 years as a journalist and editor in Moscow and is now living in New York City. So let me just read this um, before um, giving the podium. When each day brings more news that we are used to seeing in a week and the kind of news that only the most catastrophic imagination can accommodate, we find ourselves talking about the Reichstag fire. Time feels both accelerated and slowed down. And so we imagine that we have been talking about the fire for years. It is the new president's new clothes, invisible yet always present in our perception of him. The Reichstag's fire, it goes almost without saying, will be a terrorist attack. And it will mark our sudden, obvious, and irreversible descent into autocracy. Here is what it will look like. On a sunny morning, you turn on the television as you make coffee, or the speaker in your shower streams the news, or the radio comes on when you turn the ignition key in your car. The voices of the newscasters are familiar, but their pitch is altered, and they speak with a particular haste. Something horrible has happened. It is not yet clear what, but thousands are dead, and more are expected to die. You hear the word terror. You feel it. 
please welcome one of the bravest and most polyphonic analysts of our times, Marsha Gessen. Thank you, Marina, for that extraordinary introduction. Um, I'm going to, to, to talk a little personally, um, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, my own experience. Um, I cannot describe the experience of submersion because it happened gradually, almost imperceptibly. I experienced only the immersion because it was sudden. It happened to me twice. First, when protests broke out in Russia in the winter of 2011, I found myself among tens of thousands of my compatriots. Some faces were familiar, but most were not. And yet, those, those people with unfamiliar faces held up witty posters. The Russian protests doubled as a kind of contest of wit that contained political commentary that I could absorb and appreciate, even though it was not my own. Yet this was a new experience, or at least an experience I hadn't had in a number of years. For more than a decade leading up to this moment, the public sphere in Russia had been vanishing. As a journalist, I had experienced the attack on the public sphere personally. With about 100 of my colleagues, I found myself locked out of a weekly magazine where I had worked for five years because it had been taken over by the state. As a political reporter, I had found myself blacklisted and disinvited from events at the Kremlin. I had also received death threats and had opened my apartment door to find a thug stationed there solely for the purpose of menacing me. I had also experienced the closure of the public sphere as a citizen, a consumer, if you will. The television channel where I got my news was taken over by the state. It didn't immediately turn into a propaganda outlet that transformation would actually take years, but it became mediocre in the way of aggressive demonstrative conformity. I found the experience of watching it to be embarrassing for me, and so I turned off the television. This was a time before social networks, although in an early portent of what was to come, a relatively small or relatively large, depending on how you look at it, number of intellectuals in Moscow and St. Petersburg and other places refashioned an American blogging platform called LiveJournal.com into a kind of social network. And I actually want to describe how it worked because um, as I looked back on, um, on those years, I found it quite remarkable what had, what had happened then. Um, so the way that LiveJournal.com worked was that one maintained a blog with the option of making each entry visible to all or only friends or only oneself. And then one friended people, and if the friendship was mutual, the bloggers could read one, each other in their own feeds. And this sounds exactly like Facebook, um, albeit a tiny one, but this was three or four years before the seed of Facebook was even sown. And at the time, the internet used what was known as standalone blo blogging platforms. People wrote things, other people read them, and if the blog became popular, its contents had a way of bubbling up and spilling over into other kinds of media. But in the absence of a public sphere, in Russia, a blog wouldn't just get read. It could only be read by invitation, as a result of a special connection, a function of special knowledge. And so it, cre it, it necessitated creating this sort of closed network where people handpick their audiences. Um, and I had my live journal and a small on and offline community of like-minded people that I felt kept me sane. On occasion, I would take the measure of the quality of my community. For example, a friend would have, ha would have to attend the wedding of another friend who had married a man who had stayed at the television channel and become by now a full-fledged propagandist. And I would note with satisfaction that this was not a social connection of mine. I didn't have to sully myself by, by partying with a propagandist. As the years went on, I could state with satisfaction that my circle was indeed pure. No one in it worked for the state in any capacity. No one who took money from the state ever cro crossed the threshold of my home. My home was in fact often filled with people, all of whom knew each other usually quite well. The circle was involved in an ongoing discussion of politics and current events as well as history, especially as it related to politics and current events. <clears throat> 
And what I'm describing might sound familiar to some of you. Back in the Soviet period, foreigners who visited Russia often fell in love with these circles in Moscow or Leningrad intelligentsia, these closed communities in which everyone seemed to be everyone else's second cousin or ex-wife. And everyone was friendly, but best of all, everyone shared a cultural background and current views. People could use quotations from books to communicate because they had all read them. People could crack jokes about the regime and laugh, dancing at the edge of the abyss, abyss because they so clearly saw eye to eye. Now, the Putin era incarnation of the Soviet intelligentsia cluster was not mindless. And my friends and I tried to refrain from quoting the Master and Margarita, the source of the earlier generation's language. Meaning, we were aware that our parents, for all their intellectual pretensions, had been unworldly people. And we found this slightly embarrassing. At the same time, the sense of closeness and mutual understanding that we developed felt irresistible in part because it was familiar to many of us from childhood experience. It produced a sense of unparalleled warmth, or the illusion of warmth, Arendt would have told us, that comes from the elimination of space between people, the disappearance of the world in which all politics happens. But the submersion was pleasurable and gradual, and the disappearance of the world went unnoticed because we thought we got our news from each other. The second time I noticed that I had emerged was when I had to leave Russia and come here. And immigration is always inevitably and usually painfully a time for growth, the kind of growth that occurs when one throws off the hard shell that protected one and gave one shape before exile. But I realized how narrowly I had been reading and thinking over the preceding decade. I had good reasons. I had been engaged in righteous battle. I had been protecting my purity, which is nothing to make, light, to make light of. I believe that the project of staying away from, you know, people who condone political murders or who promote a government that wages imperial war is right. I am still proud of having stayed out and stayed away, even to have stayed away from hang gliding with the Siberian cranes. Um, I am also increasingly mindful of what living under siege has cost me. And quite simply, the only skill I had really honed for more than 10 years was the skill of protecting the views I already held. Over the last year, we have all become familiar or been reminded, as I have, of the experience of being embarrassed when the television is on and of turning it off. We have been talking about the importance of getting our views from trusted sources but not nearly enough about the criteria for trusting the sources and for maintaining enough distance from those sources to ensure that the world doesn't disappear. We have also had the experience of living under siege. It's a different sort of siege caused more by the cacophony of news and sheer nonsense created by the president on a daily basis. I think it's safe to say that all of us are living in a state of low level dread always suspecting that we're missing something of enormous impact while chasing something else of enormous impact. We draw solace from friends who see eye to eye and from late night comedy shows that affirm our sense of reality by laughing at horrible things that we wouldn't normally think are funny. I'm particularly concerned about the seeming unanimity of thought on Russian meddling in the election. I am reminded sometimes of Arendt's essay, rather the Princeton lecture in which she described the way McCarthyism looked from Europe, how frightening the apparent conformity of thought appeared from across the Atlantic, especially because, as she wrote, it exhibited all the elements of conspiracy myth-making. Now, she pointed out in that lecture that, um, that, there, uh, that what couldn't be seen from Europe was the opposition to McCarthyism and the defense of people who were the objects of a witch hunt. And of course, the difference between the current um, myth-making and McCarthyism is that there, aren't, there isn't a witch hunt, contrary to what the president might tell us. Uh, there aren't powerless people or people with less power being targeted by people with more power. Um, I actually find that even more frightening because there isn't a moral basis for an opposition to what is, to me, evidently conspiracy thinking, which doesn't mean that there wasn't a conspiracy. Um, and the conformity and the conspiracy myth-making 
combine to create that sense of being right and perhaps even pure that can barely be noticed when you're immersing yourself in it. And I just hope that we do get to emerge and see the world once again. Thank you. Because we're running a little bit late, there's not going to be a proper break at all. So we're going to go until 12 o'clock, and we're going to immediately open the floor up uh, to questions if Masha will allow it. Okay. Um, no, I think this is fine. Yeah, let's. If there, if there are questions. I hope there. Yes, there do seem to be questions. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, okay, this is on. Firstly, I just want to say thanks for speaking. Um, my dad knows you, Elliot Bornstein, and he spoke very highly of you. Um, yeah, that's all. Um, Thank you. Good to the question. Um, what do you think the general media representation of Putin leaves out? I mean, the general representation is that he is a horrible dictator, which in many ways is accurate. Um, but do you think there are certain facets of his character that are generally overlooked uh, in favor of just an easy representation? Oh, that's actually a great question. <clears throat> yeah, I think the aspect of his character that's often overlooked is his mediocrity. Uh, and... Uh, and I actually, you know, it's funny, but it's also hugely important because I think that uh, we, we actually get some comfort from imagining, on the one hand, that the really sort of horrible uh, tyrants and dictators of history were geniuses of their craft. Uh, and that's not true. It is particularly, I think, uh, comforting to think that right now in the United States because we have this... Uh, hope that the incompetence of the current administration will somehow protect us. Uh, and I don't think incompetence in power is protective, especially when it's the incompetence of somebody who has a finely honed instinct and insatiable thirst for power. And that's definitely true of Putin. Hello, is this on? Okay. Is there anything interesting to say about uh, conversations between generations in Russia that experienced um, what they saw as political oppression before 1989 and those coming to political consciousness, let's say, now? Uh, so I'm interested in the, in the Russian conversation, intergenerational conversation about do you see we were right, or do you see nothing changes, or do you see, etc.? Well, funny you should ask. I just wrote uh, a book about generations. It's about 550 pages, so uh, I don't know if I can summarize it. But, um, but actually, I mean, the book uh, largely revolves around this idea that, uh, that the Soviet project of creating the new man created a kind of uh, sort of cultural institution of people uh, who had honed the skills for surviving under totalitarianism. And the belief was uh, in the late 1980s that since a generation had passed, since mass terror stopped, the, the, those skills, that, that institution, that cultural institution, was gone, and so, so the Soviet Union was going to collapse because of it. 
And so when the Soviet Union collapsed right on schedule, that hypothesis seemed to have been affirmed. Uh, and then things got a lot more complicated. And uh, one of the things that got more complicated is that um, what sociologists that I write about have called homo savetikus, that, you know, the, the kind of person who is who's best suited, who's, who's developed the survival skills for totalitarianism, isn't going anywhere, uh, is not only thriving but reproducing, and still seems to be sort of the dominant type in Russia. Uh, one of the effects of that is that every generation keeps hoping that the following generation is going to finally uh, embrace freedom and, and move past the Soviet legacy. Um, and so a lot was, uh, has been made of the fact that so many of the recent protests, uh, uh, so many people in the recent protests are teenagers. Um, and that just absolutely breaks my heart because so many of the people who are talking about the teenagers are people in their mid-30s who were the youthful face of protest five years ago and who've now written themselves off and are looking to teenagers to save them. And I don't know who comes next, but I don't have a lot of hope for, for toddlers. Uh. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, this gentleman. My question is about maybe you could talk a little bit about your um, thinking about being in exile. You called yourself an exile. I think it's very interesting to, so you are in exile, but then from my perspective, what I heard a lot of is that now you are part of the, I mean, you're writing for like the big establishment American press, which is very I, fascinating. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting because there's so much history of Russian exiles moving out, coming back, starting revolutions. So I just, I'm just curious about your experience your, your feelings of being, what does it mean to be an exile to you and your relation now to the American establishment and all of this kind of questions, which I'm sure you've thought about. Um, yeah, <laughs> I've thought about it. Um, it's a, that's a very difficult answer to, uh, question to answer briefly, but because um, I do think about it a lot and I actually want to write about it at some point. Uh, but um, I mean, I think the state of being in exile is the state of having not chosen to not live at home. And I, uh, I, this has happened to me a couple of times. Uh, I first came to this country when I was 14 uh, with my parents, and then I went back as a correspondent in the early 90s, uh, spent more than 20 years in Russia, and then had to go into exile again uh, less than four years ago. And the second time around, it was actually much more pleasant than the first time around because it's much more pleasant not to be 14, uh, but also, uh, also because to some extent I, had, I, I made that decision. Um, and my teenage children didn't make that decision. I think it's, 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 it's much more difficult for them. Um, but also I think that uh, the, sort of the, the initial um, goal, uh, cer uh, certainly for Russian um, exiles or Russian political emigres, was to become Americans. And I remember feeling very defensive whenever I wouldn't be perceived as an American here. But then when I went back to Russia, when, I wouldn't be, uh, when, when a journalist once asked me, Do you feel, uh, is it better to be a Russian in America or an American in Russia? Uh, and I was furious because I thought I was a Russian in Russia and, uh, and, and an American in America. Uh, and uh, it took me years to actually embrace being an, an outsider everywhere I go and, and realize that there's enormous benefit, especially for a writer, to never feeling like you belong. I, there's a request here, and then I would love a, a, a speech. Yes, then it will be the person next to the very nicely colored chairperson. <laughs> yes, uh, thanks so much. Uh, this was a generally accurate presentation of the destiny of the Russian public sphere, which is indeed um, depressing. But uh, my question is, uh, how would you relate this story to the topic of the conference, the crisis of democracy? Uh, what happened to democracy in the process? Because, um, okay, <clears throat> Putin is not a big Democrat in the sense of, like, 
stimulating uh, public discussion, but 85% uh, of Russian population support him. Unlike the 5% of Russian population that supported his liberal predecessor. Uh, and uh, the uh, Moscow intelligentsia uh, that you described uh, tried to hold to power in the 90s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, <clears throat> it was not popular, and uh, it had to start the authoritarian practices that Putin then developed. So uh, we get back to what uh, the very important discussion that Roger started out. Uh, democracy is a contradictory um, uh, notion, and by the way, Hannah Arendt was not very much fond of it, uh, because it implies at the same time the values of uh, individual human rights and public sphere, and the actual support of majority of the masses the masses don't like these uh, liberal ideas for the most part, which we increasingly witness. I, um, I think Hannah Arendt would take issue with the idea that the masses uh, are a determinant factor in democracy. But um, uh, I, um, uh, you know, I, I actually uh, can tell you with a fair amount of certainty that in any country where you see a number like 85%, popularity, you're not talking about taking a measure of democratic public opinion. Uh, because that kind of number suggests that people don't have a choice. Uh, and, um, and people very much don't have a choice in Russia, right? Uh, I mean, Putin has dismantled uh, elections. He has taken over the media. And so, um, even if we imagine, and I don't think this would be correct, but I, even if we imagine that people are uh, sort of casting about to see who they like best in Russia um, and choosing Putin, they're choosing Putin from a pool of one candidate uh, because he is the only politician who is reflected in the media to the extent that the media exists. Um, but of course, they're not actually casting about to see who they like best, uh, even out of a pool of one candidate, because what has happened in Russia is that, as Putin, and I don't think he set out to recreate the totalitarian regime, he set out to create a mafia state. He set out to hold on to power in perpetuity and enrich himself. But because he set out to create a mafia state on the ruins of a totalitarian society, the institutions and mechanisms that he has succeeded in recreating are the institutions and mechanisms of a totalitarian society. And or as uh, the sociologist Lev Gutkov has uh, put it brilliantly, I think he's called it recurrent totalitarianism, which is like recurrent flu. It's not as deadly as the first time around, but the symptoms are unmistakable. And um, what that means is that people have been robbed of the ability to form their own opinions. That's what happens in a totalitarian society. And so that's how you get a number like 85 or 86 percent, actually 86 percent is the, the number that's, that's usually banded about in Russia, but you, know, you might as well say 96 percent or 76 percent, it doesn't really matter. It's not that people are uh, reflecting back what they're expected to say and hiding what they really think. It's that there's no longer a place in which they can really think. And the, all they can do is reflect back what's expected of them. Thanks. Um, so, is this on? Okay. Just speaking from my own experience, um, I was born in Moscow, but I grew up here in the United States. Um, I'm still really connected to Russia. I have a lot of relatives there and I visit and I see the situation. Um, and it's really painful to watch um, the political situation right now. And I'm just wondering if there's anything um, you think that we, the young generation, some of us living abroad can do about it to change it or if there's anything that we can do at all. Um, oh, that's the hardest question of all. Um, I don't, you know, I think that uh, the, the Putin regime is not going to last forever because nothing lasts forever. But it's a closed system and it's going to, we'll know that, when it's, that it's over when it's over. 
Um, and I don't think it's going to end because of pressure from the outside, whether it's from the outside of the country or from the outside of the actual system, right? It's this, it's, the system is eventually going to collapse, uh, whether it's when Putin dies or, or, or before. Um, and I have to say that I don't hold out a lot of hope for what happens after. Which is not to say that uh, I, I, I'm not a proponent of the idea that, oh, the hardliners will take over uh, when, when Putin dies, right? Uh, that's not my fear. Uh, and in fact, I think that that's, uh, that kind of, um, uh, of fear has been trafficked in very effectively by Putin or, you know, uh, I mean, Viktor Orban actually uh, weaponizes the, the, the more radical right with incredible skill, uh, right, to show that the alternative is worse, and that's what Putin has done. And so that's not what I'm talking about, right? Uh, I'm talking about just the amount of, of, of uh, damage uh, that has been done to the fabric of Russian society, both by the, uh, the years of Soviet totalitarianism and now by the 17 years now of, of, of Putinism, um, or actually 18 years of Putinism. Um, he has now set a record for, uh, 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 he, he is second only to Stalin in the number of years that he has been uh, at, at the helm in Russia. Um, and um, so I, I think that the, uh, the, you know, the, com uh, the conversation about what didn't happen in Russia in the 1990s is much too long to have right now in this one answer. Um, but one thing that, uh, that perhaps uh, young people need to concern themselves with both in Russia and outside of Russia, or you know, people who identify themselves with Russia, is sort of the Russian story, right? Um, and the Russian story as it concerns the, uh, the 20th century, the Russian story as it, you know, as it concerns the, the myth-making by the 20th century. Um, I don't, I, uh, I'm not convinced that a new story is capable of saving Russia, but it's the best chance there is. Uh, and um, and sort of, I think any, there, 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 there are small groups of, of younger people in Russia right now who are running all sorts of, of, of history projects um, that are aimed at, uh, as, as, at, at, at reckoning with the past to create that kind of story that is an alternative to Putin's sort of myth-making that's all built around World War II. And so if, if, if anything is to be done, then it's probably that. My question is that, um, as a writer, um, what do you think is the effect of your work if there is one both here in, in America and in Russia? What I think the effect of my work is? Of your writing. I don't think it's for me to say. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I, I find it, um, I think it's an incredible luxury to be able to write and speak out. I think that, uh, especially now in this country, if, uh, if I didn't have a chance to, to, to mouth off and get published all the time, I'd probably feel very powerless. Um, and uh, and I realize you know what uh, how lucky I am to, to to have that and to have an outlet and to, and to feel like I'm engaging with people, uh, but it's certainly not for me to judge and certainly not right now uh, what the effects of my work my, my work may be. I just want to um, ask about steal yours for a second. Just that um, Marsha Gessen also writes beautifully about other writers. So I think you should look up um, some of the writers she has analyzed, some people like Svetlana Alexievich and uh, Ulitskaya, and even French writers. She wrote about Limonov, uh, a, 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 a novel that um, is by Emmanuel Carrère. She, she really has promoted wonderful writers, um, and I recommend that you also read her writings about literature. Thank you so much. Sorry to privilege some of the students, but I, I will get to as many people as I can. Kind of a broad question, but um, what are your thoughts on Alexei Navalny? What are my thoughts on Alexei Navalny? 
So Alexei Navalny, for, for those of you who don't know, is a Russian um, activist and organizer. He uh, was best known for a number of years as an anti-corruption blogger, and he, um, he created a really inventive way of, uh, of documenting and, and showcasing corruption in the Russian government. Um, and I have incredible respect for his inventiveness and his energy and his courage in acting. Uh, he has been brought up on trumped up charges several times. He has not been in prison for a long period of time, although right now, as we speak, he's in jail, uh, but he's, he's been locked up for 20 days. Um, but um, he hasn't been locked up for years because people come out to protest every time that he is brought up on charges. And in fact, when he was sentenced to five years in 2013, thousands of people um, risked arrest by coming into, out into the streets in Moscow, and the following morning he was released. Um, and that was, that was actually uh, an incredible example of how the regime will step back when it encounters actual mass resistance. Uh, Navalny's brother is uh, in, in a prison colony. Every time, uh, and the ho uh, he's basically being held hostage. The authorities clearly hope that by punishing the brother, they can stop Navalny from acting. The brother has asked Navalny not to stop acting, and so every time Navalny stages an action or stages a protest or publishes a film about uh, you know, Dmitry Medvedev's uh, million dollar collection of, uh, of, of designer sneakers, um, the brother is tortured, literally, replaced in solitary and, and, and tortured, and um, he continues to act. So uh, I think he's, he's uh, brave, he is a free man in Moscow, which is a rarity, and he is uh, and he is inventive. I also uh, think he's not political, uh, and I have a, uh, a a real issue with the uh, the sort of the, um, the message around which his protests are organized. They're organized. Uh, they're protests against corruption. Um, and for good government. They're basically de demanding good government practices from the people who are in power in Russia now. Uh, corruption is certainly a very important part of, of what, what ails Russia. It's a structural part of the Putin government, but it is not by any means the most important thing that's wrong with it. The most important things that are wrong with it are you know, murders of political opponents, jailings of political opponents, um, imperial colonizing wars in Georgia and Ukraine. And sort of compared to that, I find the issue of corruption a little bit minor. Uh, and and I, find, uh, uh, I find the rhetoric, Navalny's rhetoric uh, and, and, and his allies' rhetoric around those issues and around corruption quite disturbing. Uh, to what extent do I think democracy is threatened in the United States? Um, I think it's threatened. I think that this country has been becoming less democratic for a number of years. I, I am with Roger in that. I, I, I don't know if my chronology would be exactly the same, but I think there are actually a number of stories we can tell about how the United States has been turning away from... Uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, I don't think that there's such a thing as a, a democracy that's been achieved. A democracy, a democracy is um, an ideal... Uh, immutable ideal toward which we're either moving or we're moving away from it. And I think we have been moving away from it for many years. And I think that the rate at which we're moving away from it has increased greatly in the last year. Um, if, um, if, if a crisis, if a full-on crisis is averted, we will never quite know what we have prevented. Um, but we may actually be descending into, into truly dark times. I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit more. You said in your remarks earlier, um, referring to many of our obsessions with uh, Russian involvement in 
the American election last year, um, and you described that being um, uh, a conspiracy in itself. And but then you said not that there wasn't a conspiracy. So I d how do we weigh that? Okay. So um, we don't know if there was a conspiracy. Right. We don't know if there was actual collusion between the Trump campaign and, 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 and Russian agents. Um, we should know, and presumably as a result of the Mueller investigation, we will know eventually. What disturbs me is that is the, cons uh, uh, and this is a complicated idea to convey, right, that the possible existence of a conspiracy is no excuse for conspiracy thinking. But conspiracy thinking is, I think, sort of an equal and opposite reaction to Trumpism, which is itself an exercise in conspiracy thinking. I think it is extremely dangerous. It's extremely dangerous for uh, probably two main reasons, uh, sort of a smaller one and a bigger one. The, 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 or actually, I don't know which one of them is smaller. So two, big, two, two main reasons. Um, one is that it distracts us from other things that are happening. And um, I, I, you know, I, I had this incredible experience the other day, actually. I've, I've been on book tour for the last week. And so uh, on Wednesday, I was, uh, uh, yes, yeah, so Wednesday of last week, I was in Boston. And this was the day the New Yorker published that incredible piece by uh, ProPublica and Andrea Bernstein of WNYC on how the Trump children avoided prosecution by bribing, apparently bribing uh, prosecutors. And, and I was in Boston, I had a full day of interviews. In Boston, uh, you know, it's a pretty big media market with pretty sophisticated journalists. And uh, the journalist, every single journalist who talked to me wanted to talk to me about the story that ha was on CNN that year, uh, that day. And the story on CNN had the headline that Russian ads on Facebook were targeted to Wisconsin and Michigan. Now, if you actually read the story, the story said that some of the $100,000 worth, $100,000 worth, right, in a campaign of about $6.8 billion, $100,000 worth of ads on Facebook, some of them were geographically targeted and some of those, an unknown percentage, were targeted to Wisconsin and Michigan. In other words, there was nothing in this story at all. Right? We don't know how many ads, uh, what proportion of ads, out of the tiny amount of ads that have been documented, uh, were targeted to Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, that is clearly a less important story than documented criminal wrongdoing on the part of people who are working in the White House right now. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, for all the sort of unlimited bandwidth of the internet and cable news, people actually have limited bandwidth and they can only focus on one thing at a time, generally speaking. And the journalists I talked to not only didn't have any interest in the other story, they hadn't read the other story. And uh, every single, in every single one of those interviews, I would say, no, let's talk about the other thing. And I said, no, 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 but, but this, is, this is so much more important. And it was happening on air, and you know, they actually, the host often has a bigger microphone uh, than the guest. And uh, I'm sure that what the message that listeners were, were, were getting every time was that we were talking about Russian collusion. Um, so that's, that's one problem. It, does, it, takes us, um, it takes attention uh, away from things that are actually out in the open and documented and gets us to thinking about things that are hidden and need to be exposed. And that in itself is destructive to our thinking. The other problem that I have with it is that it serves, it serves the imagination by othering Trump. It's like we really want him to have come from outer space. Um, or at least for Russians to have elected him. <laughs> and the longer we think that the Russians elected him, the longer we don't engage with the fact that Americans elected him. Questions, all right? And I apologize. I know there are people who are desperate. 
Thank, uh, thank you very much for your comments. Um, I wanted to um, ask you a question, sort of a bifurcated question about the um, about your Reichstag fire uh, analogy. Um, my first my first question is: <clears throat> To what extent uh, do you find that uh, our elected officials, um, <clears throat> if heaven forbid, uh, such a moment as as you write about should come, uh, are prepared to hold the line? Uh, against authoritarian claims such that that moment does not, in fact, uh, evolve into a Reichstag fire. And, and then should it, or should it start to go that way, what can we as citizens do to help our elected officials, or rather encourage our elected officials, uh, to hold the line in such an instance? Um, so I actually need to set the record straight. Um, the piece that Marina read from, uh, it, it's a very long essay that in Harper's, and my point is actually that the Reichstag fire has already happened. And it happened on September 11th, uh, uh, 2001. That's when we entered a state of exception. That's when, uh, you know, and, and literally since then, three days later, the, uh, the state of emergency went into effect. That has been renewed every September since. Uh, President Obama renewed it seven times uh, each, every September of his presidency. Um, the, we have seen for the last 16 years the, you know, the continued concentration of power in the executive branch. We have been in a forever war, a war that is by definition without end because it is without objective or without achievable objective. Um, we, have, you know, we have been swimming in this sea of, of, of anti-Muslim sentiment and, uh, and irrational fear. So all of that has already happened. And um, you know, as far as um, elected officials, there was one elected official who voted against the War Powers Act that was passed on September 14th, 2001. I'm sorry? And she was a woman. Okay, one more question. Hello. Okay. Um, you were speaking on democracy now about language and the effect that totalitarianism has on language and its lasting effect, which can be really destructive. Um, and I find that interesting, especially because, you know, words like democracy or political are in and of themselves extremely loaded, so it makes it really hard to talk about these things. So I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that now or possibly how you might define those terms. How what? I'm sorry? How you might define those terms. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, no, it's a great question. Um, I've, uh, and I've been writing a bit about language because language is something that I've been obsessed with since I actually uh, first went back to Russia as a, as a journalist and realized how much more difficult it was to write in Russian than in English. Not because it's a more difficult language, it happens to be my native language, uh, but I... Um, I found it difficult to write in post-Soviet Russian because post-Soviet Russian was so inflected by, uh, by Soviet language. And one of the things uh, that had happened to it was that so many words had been discredited by abuse, right? Uh, I mean, a word like democracy or freedom or elections was used to mean its opposite, right? Elections was when you were compelled by police to go to um, a polling place and uh, check off the only name on the ballot, right? And that was actually, in, in Russian, it was called the free expression of citizen will, um, of which, you know, where every word was a lie. Right? Uh, and um, uh, and so, uh, so what that actually meant was that, was that as, as, as a journalist and a writer, I was, I was limited in, the, in my vocabulary, right? I couldn't use words from the political realm because they had all been abused. I couldn't use words from sort of the ideological realm because they had all been abused. I even found that it was very difficult to use sort of romantic language because it was suspect, because anything that had, to, uh, um, that, that had sort of strong impassioned meaning was suspect. So we stuck to really business-like language. Uh, no adjectives, no adverbs, uh, just you know, say what happened and then my, maybe people will believe you which is a perfectly sound strategy for, for writing, and I actually still en encourage, when I edit people, 
in Russian, I still encourage them to stick to that strategy, especially when they're writing about history. Uh, so just, just, to, just to really, you know, uh, to, to, to really use the kind of language that reflects uh, a commitment to facts. But, um, and, and English, you know, was so much more free that way. You could do all sorts of things in English. Um, and then Putin came in and he did more stuff to language, uh, which is just um, using language to mean nothing, which is a little bit different from using language to, uh, words to mean their opposite. Uh, but, you know, they would come up with concoctions like managed democracy uh, to describe their elections. And then suddenly, uh, you know, you would, you would be trying to write about a concept that was designed to be meaningless. Um, and so what I find um, disturbing about uh, our, our current moment is that Trump is actually doing both things. He is using words to mean their opposite, and he also just, you, you know, creates word salad in which words mean nothing. Um, and it's pretty, uh, I, I think it's, 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 it's becoming pretty damaging uh, to language. And, you know, we see, um, we see it in small ways now. Uh, we see something like fake news. You know, we, you can't use that phrase anymore. Because, and, and there was a time just a few months ago when we, we could use it meaningfully to describe something that was manufactured and presented as news but actually wasn't news. But we can't do that anymore because he seized it. Right, so, um, and that's just an individual example, um, but 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 we have to sort of be mindful of, um, of what of, of what happens to language when when it's abused from the, from, from the most powerful, you know, the biggest microphone in the country. Well, on that, oh, Roger wants one question. Would you? Oh, like, okay. oh there, yes, please, over there. Thank you for choosing me. Um, this kind of topic is kind of related to me because I was born in Tajikistan, and when I was three months old, we moved. Me and my parents moved to St. Petersburg, and I grew up there. And um, so I was just wondering, like you, you. I mean, some she mentioned that you was working in Vakruk Sveta magazine. Uh, was that during '90s? No, that was. Um, um, I was fired in 2012. Wow, okay, so that was after the 20th century. So my question was, um, was the experience with it, like were you going abroad and like maybe like gathering information and like were you publications that you made perceived in your own way or was it like affected by any other outer source? I'm sorry, I, ca I can't make up what you're saying, sorry. Um, well like the load of information that you gained, right, and the publication that you've made, were they uh, perceived in your like own way? Or was it like affected by outer source, but like outer source? I'm so I'm sorry, I don't understand. Like your information that you were posting, like right, you were a publicist. Was it affected somehow by like outer source, by the government, or was it just like, yeah, basically? Oh, oh, was 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 I subjected to censorship? Yeah. Okay, no, um, and I mean that's. Vakruk uh, Sveta, uh, which was at the time the largest magazine in, in Russia, actually. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a popular science magazine. It's 150 years old. Uh, and uh, it's, um, uh, I, was, I was the editor-in-chief in, in of, uh, of the magazine and the publishing house, which was privately owned. And what actually happened there was that uh, Putin decided that he liked the magazine. And when Putin decides that he likes something, he thinks that he owns it. Uh, and I had a surreal experience for a number of months where um, uh, there, was a, there was sort of an attempted uh, friendly takeover of the magazine. And you can't really say no to the Kremlin when it wants to take what's yours. You have to negotiate. And so the owner of the magazine negotiated. and. Uh, and it seemed like he had brokered a good deal where um, we, uh, the magazine, would get access to expeditions undertaken by the, uh, by the Russian Geographic Society, um, which is technically a non-governmental organization, but Putin is the chairman of the board. 
and uh, uh, and then in, in exchange uh, the, we would publish one piece every month about a national uh, a Russian Geographic Society expedition. And the Kremlin would also do all sorts of things for us, like uh, require schools to subscribe to the magazine, and we would become huge. And uh, um, and um, immediately we were confronted with the fact that uh, the Russian Geographic Society was thoroughly corrupt, and so a lot of what they were doing wasn't actually uh, either wasn't happening, or uh, was a, or was a money laundering operation. Or was a crony operation where you know somebody got a grant to uh, go around the world and take a picture of every uh, volcano that was still uh, uh, that is still alive in the world? But there was no research value to this uh, to this expedition, right? Um, but also, I was in an, on meetings um, with people organizing, for example, a um, an Arctic cleanup operation, which was an actual thing, uh, but they had already siphoned, they or people they were working with had already siphoned so much money off of the expedition that they couldn't sail on time. But they also couldn't tell Putin that they couldn't sail on time. So they decided, and I was present at this meeting, they decided to tell him that ships don't sail on Mondays <laughs> because it's a bad omen. And so he, because he was scheduled to come on a Monday to break a champagne bottle on the ship, on the ship's deck, and and then he was supposed to sort of see it sail off. But they were like, you know, we don't sail on Mondays. But they weren't actually technically equipped to sail, um, and they were hoping they would sail in another few weeks, uh, which they did, right? But it was it was I I, I saw sort of that that business up close, um, and then um, then it all came crashing down when. Um, uh, when I got a phone call from my publisher asking me to send a reporter with Putin uh, when he was going to go hang gliding with the Siberian cranes. Uh, and this is definitely not a story of my you know, incredible journalistic bravery. This was actually like a story of my trying to save the magazine because I said I can't send a reporter because if I send a reporter, the reporter is going to see something that you don't want in the magazine. right? Um, and I knew a bit of, uh, uh, about how Putin's nature conservation expeditions had gone, um, which was that when he went to uh, Siberia to place a satellite collar on a Siberian tiger, the Siberian tiger was actually borrowed from the Khabarovsk Zoo. <laughs> and uh, when he went to Chukotka to place a satellite collar on a polar bear, the polar bear was captured nine days ahead of time and heavily sedated because they didn't know when Putin was going to fly in. So they could then stage, you know, the Siberia, the, the polar bear just, you know, ambling by uh, in the wild, and Putin, you know, putting a satellite collar on him. Uh, it was just so I knew that this, uh, and I was aware of the cranes uh, of the of the effort to repopulate uh, the Siberian cranes. I actually had a story assigned on it. I just didn't know that Putin was going to get involved. So I said, I don't want to send a reporter because this is not going to end well, and it ended badly right that minute because the publisher fired me. Uh, wow. So, uh, you know, can you call that censorship? Of course, it's a kind of censorship, but it's not, a, it's not the kind of censorship that, uh, that, that comes directly from, um, from the top. It's the kind of censorship that is a function of fear that has been, uh, that is, that has been conditioned over generations. Thank you. Well, I think we're